we talked last time about the you you gave the neo prefix yeah. and yeah. was there something you were going to say about that before we wrapped up as as far well, as i like had a these... new idea um i thought of maybe neo as kind of like accepting an idea as true and building on it you can see neo right. aristotelian for example right. would be mostly accepting aristotle and right. building and post is usually like Oh, forget this prior thinker. We'll pick a right. new one. Right. That's how I kind of distinguish. Like you might say, oh, Aristotle is mostly wrong. So I'm going to come up with something new. Therefore, post Aristotelian. And that's the way yep. I think you could use the terms. That would make sense. Okay, got it. Cool. Do you think that? So I was thinking about this and there is so i'll just tell you what what i've put here so there's this question about does a belief in another world or dimension always mean hatred of this world because there's two reasons i was thinking about this so so one is leonard peikoff was explaining why philosophy developed in ancient greece and he he said uh yeah so comparative political freedom but then also the the nature of the greek religion which was anthropomorphic and it was much more this worldly. And he gave this quote from, I don't know if you know this, but it's, I think it was Achilles really? saying, yeah. So Achilles was saying he'd rather be the slave, a slave on earth for another man, some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive than rule down over here or over all the breathless dead. So he'd rather be on earth than in, in heaven or wherever he is. Right. So that, that sort of embodies the Greek, the Greek view but yeah this is a case of they do believe in another dimension and yet they don't hate this world so is it do you think it's can we simply reduce this question you know and so before that there were there were other religions who believed in another world but for them that had a different impact on their culture like the ancient egyptians orientating the, themselves towards death do you think that what do you think the difference is is it simply the degree to which they accept another world or, or take it seriously um, or what because you can get belief in another world and yet love of this one right are the greeks are an example of that i mean i might not love both i mean i think you could theoretically love both yeah but one point about the ancient greeks at least what they thought about death they didn't strictly think you went to like a heaven like the underworld is accessible through our world it's not another okay. dimension like you go down the river sticks and you can get there. I think I think Odysseus went into the other world even to rescue Sorry? someone. I think Odysseus even went into the underworld okay. and came out. Right. People have gone into it, like in Greek myth. And even when you die, it's portrayed as a boring place to live in the underworld. Not much is happening there. And like you're just a wandering soul. Your soul goes there, but it's not another dimension, strictly speaking. Got so it. in a way, that's the way that even their view of death is more this worldly than a Christian, because it's even still connected to this world, technically. Right. But you could say that even platonic forms would be on that, though. So I guess you could say Plato made it more explicitly another dimension. But naturally, I think the Greek mythology and Greek culture was still more about this world, even in death. Okay, so it is it is then the case of to the extent that you accept the premise that there is some other dimension, the true dimension where things make sense, then you do hate yeah. this world. That that is but yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Like I think even their view of the underworld is almost like Judaism, I think, where there's no heaven strictly speaking. Right. But you die and I don't remember the other details, but it's more grounded than it. So you go to heaven. Of another dimension and where the true goodness is so in a way you could say if that's where true goodness is how could the real world have goodness yeah With things like that but the more detached you are i think the more hatred you would have of the real world like if it's really well, detached then how much could you really appreciate right. the real world okay all right so then that was based that question was based on my misunderstanding yeah. of the greek 
religion. I thought that it was otherworldly, but just emotionally more attached to this one. But I, I maybe, I no, you're you're right. So then that makes sense. It's it's to the extent to which you accept that as a premise. Yeah. The other I mean, they still believe that like your soul wandered around the underworld and that was bodiless, but nonetheless, it was still the place itself was still connected to the world. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I guess, you know, I, I remember ages ago asking you, like we were reading through Opar and I was asking you about, well, there are people who have these kind of random kind of, it seems like compartmentalized beliefs about yes. some magical God or God of love. And so mm -hmm. this sort of gets at that. Th this is the answer to that. It's just the extent to which you accept that as, as a premise. Same I with the cultures. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me cross this out. Okay. On the importance of Thales, this is what Leonard said. So I'll just let you read it. This is my edition, the last thing at the end that I bothered. I, I think he said that, but I'm not, I'm not sure at this point. Yeah. Do, do you think that's accurate? Is that basically the basis for the importance of Thales that suddenly we're going from ascribing natural phenomena to gods in the heavens to trying to look out into the world and going, oh, there is the world stuff. How does this thing become that thing? How does that thing become this other thing? Mm -hmm. So it's sensory observation as a precondition of knowledge. Is it accurate for me to say that that was the implication? I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know enough about Thales. Yeah, I, mean, okay. I would just be saying things. I heard from Peacock, that's about all I know is about, know about Thales. Okay, so th this idea of, he, he said that, you know, there were, so this is, I think this was the introductory lecture and he, he was asking, okay, well, he began with, you know, why did philosophy and st science start with the Greeks in the sixth century BC? He did say there were flourishing civilizations long before this, but insofar as the philosophy was explicit, it was metaphorical, mystical, mythological, filled with parables and dogmas and so on. So when we, when we describe a philosophy as, I get systematic, systematic meaning the questions you raise are related to one another. The, the ideas yeah. you bring up are also have a relationship to each other, but mm -hmm. to say it's self-conscious, is that, does that mean <clears throat> in this context, do you think self-conscious means if I, if I had a self-conscious philosophy is, is that simply the opposite of metaphorical, mystical, mythological, as in it's, it's like prose, it's asking questions in a dry manner. Um, I thought it just meant explicit, but how many call it self-conscious, systematic, critical. Critical I interpret as asking questions, that basic questions. That's how I interpret that. But self-conscious is, is, um, cause I've heard that a lot, like a self-conscious philosophy. There was a word missing, I think, but not what you'd call a self-conscious systematic critical philosophy like there's a word missing in that oh, no, no 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 probably a is shouldn't be there oh that's what i think it's not entirely okay. what he said but it is close to word for word like the things i didn't know i wrote down like this self-conscious self-aware systematic i'm not even sure what self-conscious means here okay i would think it means I'm self-conscious, like aware of oneself, but what does that have to do with this? The other two points make sense. Right. Systematic and critical. They're not really reflective or doesn't really indicate reflecting about those myths, like taking them for granted or merely taking them as stories and not reflecting much further. Okay. Self-conscious could mean like not really self-reflective, like taking for granted, not really questioning, 
could be like that. Just like, it's like traditions. Like you don't necessarily question them. You just take them for granted sometimes. And if you just take it for granted, though, it's not really a philosophy. It's kind of like a mythical way of approach or mythological. You just take those traditions for granted. Right. Okay. I see. Let's see what else I had in here. Uh, okay, so this was in... So Thales was looking for the world stuff. And then Heraclitus yeah. said the only world stuff he found was the process of change. And yeah. he said that the process of change was the essence of reality. Would you say that the it, that I can... When you say that something is the essence of reality, are you saying that it's... Uh, is this something other than just metaphysical or does this have a meaning different from, cause I am, maybe I'm confusing this with essence in concepts, but to say, yeah, change is the essence. Are we saying it's the most important metaphysical aspect or are we saying it is the meta, it, it is the same thing as metaphysics? Seeing so the most important thing, I think in this context, it's just in this context of objectivism, it's always about the thing viewed as most important to okay. the concept, which okay. I, I don't think Heraclitus had the concept essence, but I believe Peacock mentioned even that he was using terms from modern context that they might not necessarily know about. So it's our characterization of these philosophers. Right. They didn't right. actually have an idea of essence, which is part of the reason they had these ideas because they didn't really know what an essence was. They didn't have that concept to deal with these confusions or yeah. difficulties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, th that makes sense. I'm just reading and seeing what. Okay. So Heraclitus also, so he says the process of change is metaphysical. And then from that, he concludes that everything is changing in every spe respect at every instance. As soon as I step into the river, it's a different river. If I step out, it's a different river. Every moment is different. And because of that, as soon as you say it, like when you're, you know, your tongue moves from the bottom to the top, like it's not it anymore, it's different. Mm -hmm. And do you, is it, I'm right in saying that basically what they're doing is, because it's not like I look out into the world and I see change everywhere. Like, you know, there are things that are not changing. And so they just, seem to attach themselves to one particular aspect and then just jump and massively generalize from that. Just like, you know, Pythagoras saw um, that musical instruments, the, the notes that were produced by them or whatever had some relationship to numbers. And then he jumps to that to say, everything is numbers. Like, yeah. uh, is, is that what they're doing? They're just making these massive, overly generalized leaps in whatever little aspect they're identifying in reality. It seems so because I think you could, once you take the view that it seems like everything's changing, then you could rationalize everything as changing, like moving from point to point, like vibrating from the air, breathing, you breathe every moment so you're changing, that nothing could be permanent because nothing stops moving. Everything is always going to some extent. And that's to that degree, at least, is all changing, just like the river. But I, mean, I guess some of it is going over generalizing, probably. Okay. Yeah. Because there, I mean, I get what you're saying with breathing. There is a lot of change. If you look for change, you can find a lot yes. of change. But if I look at a rock, for example, that there's like, there's, there are cases of things that are not changing, like a building that is staying the same or a rock. And so, and yeah, so those are things that are, that are going against, you know, you're looking for change, but you could also look for not, not for change. You could look for things that are standing still. And so the process they yeah. went through is just these massive generalizations from the particular aspects of reality that were changing to then they, they said, oh, well, everything is then changing, right? So it's just a massive generalization, basically. In all Usually, cases, in so. Parmenides, Pythagoras, and so on. Yeah. Well, I do think there is an element of truth because... 
I mean, I guess they had some notion that everything still had parts and the parts even moved. Therefore, there was change, at least to Heraclitus. So nothing could be permanent. That what is a rock today isn't always a rock tomorrow. So you couldn't have anything constant. You couldn't have any particular consistency about reality. And Parmenides would just be when he's trying to say that, sure, everything changes, but there is something within them that is unchanging and permanent and un forever and eternal. But I think that's the general idea of it. But in the case of Heraclitus, like I get once you make the generalization, you say even a rock is changing. It's just your senses deceive you. They don't show you. They're yeah. too crude. But before that, but when he's making the observations, like how would he say, you know, when he looks at a rock or when he looks at um, what else, uh, like a massive temple that isn't doesn't appear to change. Like, what do you mean it, it's reasonable to conclude that the parts are changing? Um, before he made that leap, I mean, like, you know, when he's just looking out into the world and going, ah, oh, the only thing, the only world stuff I see is change. Like, what, what do you think the thinking may have been with that? Like that, the, all the things that don't change. I mean, even in terms of like tomorrow, I'm a little different. I mean, I think it is reasonable to say that things will change tomorrow the same way that some things change and some things don't, but he's just getting at that. He's trying to say that some things don't is not true. That even yeah. the things that appear not to really do and everything. Yeah. And yes, I do think it's to some extent over generalization and rationalization, or at least to the extent that he didn't see it as a thing to, maybe he did see it as a problem, but could not resolve it. I when you say rationalization, though, you don't mean it in the objectivist sense, right? You just no, mean I just mean out. like yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Come up with reasons without yeah. justification. I agree with that. Yeah, he did say in this lecture that Heraclitus, even though he said all this, he did think that there must be some final law you can identify to that yes. is behind the change, which is the he said. So, so that's sort of like a what? How did I forgot how he explained it? But the point is, he said that even to that extent, you know, that's how. Um, rational the Greeks were even yes Heraclitus said he could find some law in the change but that yes. wasn't picked up by anyone yeah not at least until Plato maybe or Aristotle gets a good answer Plato gets the first one at an even reasonable attempt at answering and I think Aristotle succeeds at answering yeah it's uh these, yeah, anyway, I, I could say a lot about this, but we'll go on. It's, yeah. it's in my questions. Um, you know, so taking Heraclitus, I had this question, well, why not instead say some things change and many don't? And is the answer to that the fact that he agreed with Thales, that there has to be some world stuff, there has to be one thing tying together all the many disparate things in the world. And so with that premise... He then is looking for the one thing, and the only thing he can find is change. Is that is that the idea? Because you could have said, well, some things change, but some don't. Yeah. Um, I think he probably was influenced by Thales. It's not like populations were that huge. He probably even had conversations with Thales directly. So I'm sure they were influenced, especially if Thales was one of the first people to ever talk about this. I'm sure there was some influence there and that there's something people granted as correct about Thales that despite their protests, there was still something, some value they saw in it, something there, some answer that was possible. Yeah. The, my understanding of Thales is that his reasoning, so he was the first, so he was the first to look for a naturalistic explanation of things in the world. Yeah. And the reason that change, 
so the questions of, of change and the question of multiplicity were important was because, and the reason that Thales, con Thales concluded that there must be a world stuff is because you see things changing, like an acorn turns into an acorn tree, ice turns into water, water turns back into ice. And so how is it that you can have one thing turn into another and uh, th those things are, there must be some relationship between them. That was sort of the reasoning he right. went through. And then he said, there must be a world stuff, a thing in everything that lets it change into something else. That, and then everyone went with that, ran with that premise. That, that was my understanding on Thales. Yes, that's mine too. Right. And yeah, the, the reason he looked for the world stuff is because he, he tried to figure out why things change. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Or the reason he thought there must be a world stuff is because he thought he was trying to look for an answer to why things change or why there are so many things. I mean, that's so hard to say because we have so little about Thales. It's right. not like we have whole essays, but oh, okay. like fragments okay. of phrases oh, yeah, that yeah. we extrapolate, maybe like a few sentences each about right. maybe who knows how many pages, but not that many. So I have no way of really knowing what he may have thought and then i'm not familiar with the fragments Just yeah actually you're right say. i forgot he did say you reminded me he did say that everyone took off from just a fright we only have a fragment yeah. like a paragraph from Bay yeah. Thales. he said that well, this may yeah sorry just so we know he's like the first that's about it yep this may be a technical question, uh, but I'm curious, you may not know it. So he said that Parmenides is the first to support his convictions with reasoned argument, but yeah, Heraclitus seems like he reasoned as well. well. Do you know what he meant by that? A well-formulated argument, like premises okay. organized. Okay. Not that he had the idea of constant premises, but there was an organization to the argument, not okay. just, just these like statements. Okay, so Heraclitus had more statements, just kind of not not as connected as or more poetic, right? Like that river line, right? It's not a very deep argument. It's like a statement of observation. Got it's it. not really a philosophical argument. Okay, and then everyone, but later philosophers took it over and then gave it that argument. Yeah, I mean, arguments became better structured over time. I mean, that's what philosophy did as well. Plato organized arguments better than probably Socrates. Right. And Aristotle organized arguments even better through like prior analytics. That right. method is a form of creating arguments. So yeah, okay. in that sense, it's, you develop those argument styles. Heraclitus really had nothing. Okay, that answers everything on that. I think, I think we've basically already answered this one. We'll go through it. So Parmenides was also a monist. So mm -hmm. the world's looking for the world stuff. And he believed that everything was a planum, a solid mm -hmm. undifferentiated slab of one stuff, which has no empty spaces. Therefore, multiplicity is an illusion. <clears throat> it's just, just one entity called the one. Why does, I asked, why does Parmenides deny multiplicity but Thales doesn't but I think the answer is that like you said there's there was only a fragment left from Thales and it was the question he asked more than anything else he said because we don't have anything else he said yeah. right that's the answer to yeah that. yeah pretty much okay cool it, it's interesting because I some of these are like he said in the lecture, it, it is true that many of these things are still living issues. And so it, yeah. it's so cool to have this context because I, even today, like I, I mentioned earlier, you hear people saying like, oh, it changes everything, everything moves, nothing stays the same and so on. So, and you, it's easy because these, some of these arguments, are, I don't find them. If I put myself in this context, I don't necessarily have a good answer to these people. And so if you don't, people fall into these, yeah. um, I got into, I told you, I got into the skepticism lecture and the sophists and 
are the atomists. And I've heard, I, I've had conversations with people today that they say everything is chemicals. And um, yes, the, but it's so interesting that we can fall into these same arguments from like 3000 years ago. Yeah. Because they're like the you, basic ideas and they're easy to, they've been flowing through history forever. So now people like, recognize it right and well actually i think a lot of people might you might just fall into it naturally when you're asking questions true yeah and you mentioned to me i might it might be worth me learning about hume and it's interesting because all these questions are skeptical questions i sometimes ask and i got onto the skeptics lecture which is uh, obviously it's like uh, greek skeptics but yeah. a lot of the, the things they said are questions I have, like they're talking about, well, you know, like how can you put on a veneer of virtue and then get away with all your fiery yes. subjectivist arbitrary <laughs> desires, yes. which is like, those are the questions that I have. And it's uh, just fascinating that you can, yeah, you fall into that exact same pattern of thinking, even yeah. without having that as a context and without knowing about it. Yeah. I mean, I think you realize though, over time that despite scientific advancement, people discuss the world in very similar ways as centuries ago, that nobody was stupider back then, no. or smarter. They were all just about the same. And right. the insights you can have can be just as profound and just as arbitrary and just yep. as many people say the same things. Yes. Very interesting. I would say though, that to me, I think some of these people must have been highly intelligent. I don't know if yes. I, it's hard to say, like, you don't know, it's very difficult to imagine your circumstances. Had you done this and that differently, but sometimes right. these, these questions are uh, like trying to identify world stuff and being the first to do that is uh, difficult or, you know, looking for changes and saying everything changes and then saying, oh, therefore, it is and it isn't like I, I, you know, I even asking that question is difficult and then answering it is extremely difficult. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about Zeno's paradoxes. I don't know how much you know about that, but I didn't yeah. quite get, get the one some of there's, well, I just know the one about distance that motion is impossible. That's right. the one I know. He had two. So he had that one where motion yeah. is impossible, but then he had a second one where it, it he, he somehow showed that change is paradoxical because it, it, it puts you in all these contradictions. And I didn't yeah. follow this line of reasoning, which was, I I've broken it up and then I've got questions underneath. Uh, do you want to go through it with me? Sure. wrote an essay about parts and holes like this. I posted it on Objectives Online a while back. It was an essay, I'm not sure. I mean, I liked writing and I think it's insightful, but I'm kind of building on what I heard something Peacock speak about. So I want to say strictly it's objectivism as much as I was inspired by Peacock to analyze this kind of question. Like what is the universe composed? Yeah, is the universe a whole or a part or in what sense is it a whole or made up of parts? In what sense is it singular and in what sense is it plural? Right. Oh, is that what universe is object? I've seen that. I didn't read it because it was yes. too abstract. I saw that. It's that a very course. odd essay. It's a very weird essay, but that's why. Like, now I, I know. I saw that a while ago and I was like, I don't, what the hell would you write about a universe as an yes. object for? What is that? But now I know that yeah. it's, it's rooted in this discussion, right? Like about, yes, about change, multiplicity, uh, the universe. Specifically is about the plenum. plenum. Yeah. The plenum specifically that it made me curious. <clears throat> So I, yeah, 
I've broken it up into, and then the questions right underneath each section I didn't understand. So um, you have a question about this one? This yeah, part. so he said, yeah, basically he said, okay, well, if, imagine the universe is a whole with parts. Yeah. How many parts does it have? It will end up, he said it will end up with an infinite number of parts because every mag magnitude, every space you have is theoretically divisible without limit. Yeah. But what I don't get is that, why does it, I, I, I don't get why it makes the universe infinite. Because if you make them, you know, if you keep subdividing up parts, they don't necessarily take up more space. Um, yeah, I mean, that is actually one way to reply to why he's wrong. Ah, okay, I think. well, that's not intentional then. I just, I guess I'm using yeah. concepts of someone who's already answered yes. this question. Yes, kind of like that. He would say just, you could just infinitely divide and that is itself the problem that you can never know if it's, if it's whole, then it's not divisible. But if it is divisible, it's infinitely divisible. And um, so yeah, if there's infinite, if there are parts, they're infinite and therefore the universe is infinite. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Thus the universe consists of parts. It must be infinite. Can you see me drawing on the screen? Yes. So here's my question then. Okay, I, I'm aware that I may be using concepts that he didn't have. And so yeah. I've got that advantage. But when I think of, he's saying, okay, so if you have, if the universe is made of parts of different things, then each thing can be, he said, divisible. Each, each every magnitude is divisible. So here's the thing, I've, I've drawn a part yeah. in a, as a box. And I just look at it and I go, okay, let me, let me divide it. Okay. And now I'm dividing it. I've divided it into four pieces. Right. But it's still the same size. Yeah. And then I divide it yes. again and it's still yes. the same size. And so why didn't, I, I don't get what, what was he thinking or seeing? Cause that's what I think when I like, okay, I keep dividing, but look, it's not growing bigger. Well, even within that, you could do that forever. There is no stop. I mean, would there ever be a point? where you can stop doing that, even oh, yeah, within okay. the whole. Half of one is a half, half of a half is a fourth. And you I just keep that. going and going and going and going. Same idea. Okay, but, okay, so that's fine. I understand. So I understand his reasoning that you end up with an infinite number of parts, that's fine. Yeah. But then the, if, so the, what I don't get is when he then goes from that. Okay, so you have a universe with an infinite number of parts. But yes. then if there's an infinite number of parts, we must then have an infinitely big universe. That's the, the jump I don't get given this uh, division, right? That happens within one space. Well, it's similar to how there's, he thought there was no such thing as motion as a result of the same idea. I think because if the parts are infinite, how could there be a limit to its size in the other direction? Like if it goes and I guess you could question if, why can't I say it's just a, a given size and infinitely divisible, but it would seem that if you could infinitely divide, you could infinitely multiply, I would guess. And in a way, it's probably um, reifying an abstraction. He's making magnitudes into something concrete why would he think it's necessarily an infinite universe I'm trying to think i it's guess because like, even yeah. the parts have a no necessary size so you can't really conceive of <clears throat> what size it does have that's my guess without reading his argument further There's probably another premise. I yeah, there's something I don't, I, I didn't quite get his reasoning. I, I, I sort of understood the first paradox, um, but not, not this one, right? Because of, because of this leap that yeah. it goes from infinite number of parts. To, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would need to check the argument. Yeah. For a I premise, can just in case. I about that too. 
Okay, and then I, I think I get the rest, but what will be the size of the ultimate parts of the universe? There has to be such ultimate indivisible parts. Why, why did he think that there had to be such ultimate indivisible parts? I think, well, I'm not sure why. Oh, I was okay. still asked the same question. Yeah, I okay. think I need to know his other premise to okay, say for sure. sure. He must have a premise about the universe's size, just as he has a premise about dividing parts. So right. would answer what, how he would answer that. I, I can see, so he gets to this point where he says, well, well, look what happens. So the ultimate parts must be zero, but if they're all zero, then you won't have any size. And then you're caught in Parmenides trap and you're like, there is no nothing. And then, so if there's multiplicity from, from this premise of if there is multiplicity, you have an infinitely big universe with endless parts, but an infinitely small universe, which has sizeless parts. And so he gets you into that contradiction, but I didn't get the, you know, obviously I was stuck in the reasoning yeah. of like, how, how's he jumping from these things? But yeah, super um, interesting. Anyway, we can come back to this if you're not sure. Yeah, we should come back post, to it. Post, I don't uh, know enough about the argument to right. say much more. It's pretty cool that he managed to develop these paradoxes based on Parmenides' premises, like the the one of yeah. the, the hair. What is it? Achilles in the hair? Was that what he used? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you know of a link between the Orphicism and Buddhism, by the way? Because I, I no. read through... He, I read through the what the tenets of orphicism was. And, uh, okay, so the, obviously low and high part, and there's a soul which is akin to God in another dimension. And once, this is interesting, it was a God-like creature inhabiting another superior spiritual world, but it sinned and fell from grace. So that's Adam and Eve from the Bible. And then, yeah. so the body is therefore a prison or a tomb of the soul. And we go through incarnations what they call the wheel of birth. Isn't that, that's Buddhism. That's like the, the Dharma. And can, the, well, yeah. this way, this style would be more like Hinduism, actually. Right. They both okay. believe oh, in the same Hinduism. idea. Right. But it originates in Hinduism. Oh. Buddhism and, wouldn't accept one or two, but Buddhism would accept four in a way. Buddhism is an answer to, Buddhism is the escape from that wheel. That's what Buddhism right. claims to be, to escape that permanent circle. And reach enlightenment, which is... Yeah. Basically, a non-mind. You don't identify, you don't think. It's like a pure state without dividing up the world. Okay, so it's rather than being a state you get to, it's almost like a non-state because it's a non- Yes. It's, yeah, okay. Correct. Got it. Very interesting. I Yeah, I was listening to this and there were a lot of parallels also even to when I was reading about like the um, the monks in, in Musashi and a, they, they were saying things that were the same, you know, they're trying to purify themselves by like abstaining from earthly desires and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, wow, this is- you know, I guess it originated from the East, right? The Orphicism as a cult. Probably. So there's probably I wouldn't a, be a surprised. Mixing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they are probably not like probably went through Turkey, came through all that influence from the East. Right. There was plenty of exchange, at least right. with India. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the story is that the Greeks started developing philosophy near the time when they came into contact with other cultures, right? Yes. Probably with the Indian people. So I mean, they probably developed philosophy at about the same time. What, what do you make of, you know, when you're learning about some religion or philosophy or cult, like all the, all the, it seems like there's so much nonsense, like, okay, so they advocate purifying the soul through the ascetic life, the pleasure denying life. And yet, you know, they worship, worship Dionysus and they have these mass orgies and they all get drunk. And yeah. it's like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like you've got, there's all these conflicting elements that just yes. are crazy. Like when you read stuff like that, you just say, oh, well, this is just the way this happens. It's all just nonsense. Like, I don't want to write it off as all just nonsense, but what, how do you make sense of this? Or can you even make sense of 
these like conflicting nonsensical elements in these kind of like religions or cults. I just think of it like storytelling like in a fantasy. Well, okay. like it might not make sense, but I can at least make sense of what kind of world they create in their mind. Right. Like I don't want to understand, like you don't understand everything about Lord of the Rings to get the gist of how that system of reality works. Yeah. You get some general ideas and see like, oh, I see. They think that this is about elves and this is about dwarves or whatever it might be. Or with some sci-fi books, you could make different assumptions about the world. I think we're in the same way. I just see like, oh, what does, what kind of story is this? In a way, that's how I conceive of it. Like a mythology. What about looking at it also as like, just sort of rationalizations that caught on? Like, you know, if you get intoxicated, you're like, elevating your soul and then i don't know somehow the mass orgies happened and then they're just like oh well that's just the ritual that happened they wanted to do it and then they just rationalized it and then you get this like compact uh thing filled with all kinds of insane contradictory rituals just that's how it developed because it was partially emotional and there's no logic to it it's it is nonsense sometimes sometimes yeah i think sometimes it happens yeah it's hard to say there's many ways that even people who study mythology debate really what the purpose of a myth is. Sometimes it explains the world. Sometimes it's a rationalization. Sometimes this is just a, a justification itself or just an example of the tradition where it originates or, or even just an example of the chaos of the world if maybe if you're a Dionysian, take a Dionysian approach and say, well, the world is chaotic, so it's just another example of what it's not a rationalization, but a further example of the viewpoint I already believe, which doesn't have to be a rationalization to say, like, I believe this, and here's a way that, well, I guess that could be like a rationalization, but it could be many reasons that you just come up with the myth or the basis. Another example is that they were not, he said that they didn't believe in the anthropomorphic gods of Olympus, but then they believed in Dionysus. Wasn't he an anthropomorphic god? Like there's all that stuff as well. That's like. They probably said he was some kind of special god, oh, okay. not like them or something. Okay. They probably made up something like, oh, the true Dionysus. He is the true son of of uh, whoever gave birth to yep. the true son of Rhea is Dionysus. Therefore, he is the only true God. It's you bizarre. could have gone with that. Sort of actually makes me think of what uh, Pico was saying about the Pythagoreans, how they, you yes. know, they had all these rituals. Do you remember any of them where you're like yes. a swallow can't be on your roof or like you have to. Things like that, yeah spread out your bed sheets and make them like flat and like move, remove yeah. the impress off your butt. <laughs> yeah. like just all the, it's like uh it, it it's like uh it makes me think of someone on lsd just doing all these bizarre yeah. things it's i wouldn't be strange. surprised that they did some type of drug i would not be right. surprised right wow very interesting 